This is Philosophy versus Improv, where two sages try to teach each other a thing or two, and maybe you, the audience, get something out of it as well. I'm Mark Linsenmeyer, supposedly into philosophy. And this is Bill Arnett, a philosophy customer service rep looking to up my station. And I'm Matt Teichman, a uh, philosopher and computer programmer hanging out here at the super cool University of Chicago Library. Cool, cool. Thank you, Matt, for a longtime friend of the Partially Examined Life, been a guest many times. You were good enough to have me on your show about a year ago, and I, I filled you in on this. And so here you are. I'm calling it our season finale. I think that's <laughs> the way it's going to work out with the schedule. So we, we want to have something special. I have an old friend of the PEL fandom come and grace us with his presence. Welcome. Awesome. Outstanding. Thank you. Have you ever had to do any improv? I know you're into arts-related stuff of various sorts. Yeah, I'm definitely into being a wise-ass. But like doing it on cue is like next level pressure, I guess. No, I don't really have any experience doing improv. I was briefly part of a writing the sketches and advanced sketch comedy group in college, which I was instantly kicked out of. <laughs> I hope for scheduling conflicts, right? Not <laughs> behavior. Or- That's what they always say, right? They're like, oh, no, no, you didn't come to the meeting. Why didn't you come to the meeting that yeah. you never told you about? <laughs> Matt, your ideas are too advanced for us. We don't understand... <laughs> Well, you may not realize it, Matt, but University of Chicago was the cradle of a lot of the early Chicago improv scene. Oh, that's awesome. I, in fact, did not know that. A lot of the people out there were kind of snotty smart U of C students who really dived in and, and gave it an intellectual edge that still continues to this day when it's done well. You know, that's an interesting point. I think that's right. Yeah. Like, I think Chicago comedy does have a reputation for being like extra clever or something. Yeah. Very much started by some USC people back in the 50s, 60s. Yeah, that fits. Uh, Just to put things on a continuum. So on Matt's Elucidations podcast, he invites some of the world's greatest professorial thinkers, philosophers who have just written books to come on and more or less monologue, although Matt has really good questions to them Mm -hmm. about what they're on about. So you get to hear sort of firsthand. A lot of people in the industry find his podcast very attractive. Partially Examined Life that Matt has been on, what, five times, something? At least. I feel like more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's been a lot of years, so <laughs> you've probably been on at least once a year, which would well, make it... we started around the same time, right? Yes, so. yes. A dozen or so years ago, where we approach it more as lay people who have done a bunch of research and, and are reading in depth, but and trying to really spend the time at the other end of the spectrum. Matt came up with a topic for us, a philosophy topic, which we're not going to say yet, to discuss today, he told me what it is. I could give you a one word answer, but instead of doing that, since I think this will be a fun one to explore, I think we should just get right into the improv. And then Matt and I can face the same thing that I've often made myself do, which is trying to smuggle in some instantiation, some exploration of that <laughs> idea in the initial improv scene. And then after we do the scene, you know, which will be less than 30 minutes, certainly. Yes, <laughs> probably. Very, I mean, much shorter. But as long as if it's we, killing, if it's killing, it's got legs. <laughs> we're gonna let it run. Do you guys have like a laugh track button we can press to encourage ourselves to be extra funny? Is that for morning radio? Avant garde humor means you know you don't want people to know. You want people to wonder. I feel like all humor became avant garde during the pandemic when suddenly everything was over Zoom and there's no audience anymore. And Trevor Noah would just be like telling jokes into the void. So yeah. maybe we can aspire to that. <laughs> Well, I actually have a philosophy question or concern that involves, I know, Matt, you're involved in the computer sciences. I myself am a lapsed hardware guy. Very lapsed. Amazing. Maybe we can save that for the after chat for the, for the listeners. I think Mark. you should bring it up. We don't take turns on this show. <laughs> if, during the scene yourself, then I think the two things will crash. Now, if, if, if we want to pump the supporter portion, the Patreons will get some special conversations. I want to... I'm going to seed that. I'm going to seed that conversation. That's what I'm thinking. All right. Because well, I have an, I do have an improv lesson. I do have, definitely have an improv lesson. That's awesome. I certainly need one. <laughs> well, just so you know, Matt, the idea with this, with this style of improv, Chicago style improv, it's going to be very slice of life. Thick and cheesy. <laughs> yeah. Thick and cheesy. Uh, people in real situations. Yes. If you start being goofy or weird or strange, even if it's funny, we might start treating you like a weirdo. Does that make sense? Oh, I see. So we want to keep it sort of realistic, not too much data absurd kind of like, oh my goodness, it's a whale floating in the air. Well, we might, but then again, we're going to be freaked out by it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
we're going to treat things as though they're actually happening. I mean, sometimes this gets so real that I have some sort of heart irregularities. I, you know, I have to get medical attention after some shows. Well, real doesn't mean every scene has to be about cancer. Real just means we react to things as though they're actually happening. It sounds like you don't care about cancer. It sounds like you don't want to react to cancer. (laughs) Okay. Are we improvising right now? Is this, is this what I'm getting? Because I feel like I'm getting, this could be it. (laughs) We should have done it. I I totally bailed. That could have been the scene there, couldn't it, Mark? Yeah, three hours of not caring about cancer. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's exploring this person. No, 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 don't want to let the cat out of the bag. Let's, let's, let's get this thing rolling. I will keep this improv lesson to myself, secretly to myself, and we'll chat about it as it comes. Well, I hope you like the cabin, y'all. It was uh, the Airbnb review is really high, so I figured if you're cool, I, I just went ahead and pulled the trigger, and here we are. Hope you like it. I mean, Matt was saying that he thought that it was looked like a dump. Well, now we're here, and it's not, it's not too dumpy, is it? I have to say it's, it's much nicer than it was in the photos. Yeah, it looked absolutely dumpy in the photos. I think maybe they just use like an old camera, you know, like not one of those non-smartphone cameras. Like everything looks terrible with those. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Man, I thought the word you used were, I know this place will look like a dump from the photos. I have a lot of experience. I think I'm quoting you exactly. I can tell this place will be a dump. And if I say differently later, you should definitely correct me. Am I, did I get that right? I think you probably got it right, but I'm not sure because I was quite drunk at the time. Why don't you guys tell me about that? I mean, I sent you the pictures. Everybody was like, yeah, sure. That looks great. Looks great. Go ahead and pull the trigger on it. I mean, I know how sensitive you are about these things. I mean, the last time, you know, we uh, we were slightly like critical of your Airbnb selection. You went ballistic on us and like, couldn't find you for four days. I had to go dig you out of a ditch. Going forward, I think we could have had some diplomacy. I'm just saying you guys are clearly are having conversations off without me. And that's a little, a little disheartening, you know, that's fair. We will include you in all the merciless shit talking we engage in about you in the future in perpetuity. I promise. Dude, dude, just keep me with decisions like this. Keep me involved. All right. I thought last time this kind of thing came up, you said, and I quote, if you guys react negatively to the next Airbnb that I put forward, I don't know what I'll do. Did I quote you right on that? Probably. I'm just, I mean, look, just because I'm everybody, we are here for a long weekend. All right. We got a pile of board games. We got the Xbox. We got, this is going to be lots of beer and barbecue. <laughs> and, and three days of finished sauna lessons. I'm looking forward to that, especially. So I get it. I'm sensitive. I'm sensitive. All right. I get it. I get it. I, I don't think that means, hey, this guy's sensitive. Let's withhold. I just would like to think maybe going forward for the rest of this long weekend, if anything else comes up, we talk about it. And maybe we can have a little hand signal. If you put your hand on your head, that means this could be. Be sensitive. That sounds good. I mean, I, you know, I think maybe we should emulate Metallica in that DVD. It's just like be open and honest about our feelings. Let it all hang out for the entire trip. I'm going to start. I thought after Metallica's Black Album, they stink. They really so that some kind of monster movie. They'd already lost their way by the time that came out. I said what I think. And um, Kirk Hammett, though, said in that movie, and if I'm remembering his exact words correctly, anybody that thinks that after the Black Album, we just sucked after that is the worst kind of tool well kurt hammond is wrong kurt hammond is wrong kurt hammond is incorrect he's incorrect mark you should have put your hand on your head you you oh, knew well, sorry, that would be sensitive sorry. you sorry. knew i have strong feelings I'm just i just uh, old metallica yeah he's a mustaine guy do you, you remember mark we, we went into this whole thing about yeah he takes the mustaine side in the mustaine kirk hammond feud doesn't think mustaine ever should have gotten fired well i don't necessarily go back that far but certainly the bass player whose name I can't recall who died in that bus accident on black ice and oh, yeah. Finland. And it's killing me. That I can't recall. <laughs> he was on his way to a sauna, actually at a cabin with his friends at the time. Yeah. Well, they were on a tour bus and he, he cliff Burton, cliff Burton won the bet to get the one bunk on the bus and it rolled over and he was crushed. And that's when Metallica died. And I remember them saying in that video, Kirk Hammond again was saying, if anybody doesn't remember our bass player's name, they're not true fans. Of the- Mark, put your hand on your head, Mark. Put your hand on your head, okay? Did I get that quote right? Was that in the movie? You got the quote right, and I am trying to not be reactive. I saw your hand on your head. I prepared myself emotionally that whatever you might say could make me explode. So thank you. So what are we? We got groceries. Uh, we did, I did some grocery shopping. We got some beers, uh, a little bit of, got some, a bottle of very nice bourbon if we want, but I figure I'm going to save that for tonight or something. That's it. I'm going on a hike and fire up a board game, get some cards going. How are, how are people are feeling? Is 
Peter going to join us? And where is Peter? Do we know? Have you been talking offline with Peter? I thought he was going to meet us. He said he was going to come. Were you not in the loop on that? I mean, we, there was a, a group text, I believe. <clears throat> Apparently, as we discovered, there had been some back channels. Ooh, I hope th- I'm expecting some hands on heads very <laughs> soon here. You all admitted earlier there had been some back channels. Was Peter involved in these back channels? All right. I'm putting my hand on my head. Peter, here, I can actually read the text. If Bill doesn't know that I'm coming, but then I come, he'll be okay with it. But if he knows that I'm coming, he probably won't be okay with it. So maybe don't tell him until you get there. (laughs) Is that not true? Keeping a lid on it. Keeping a lid on it. Isn't it, you know, forgiveness versus uh, permission, that kind of thing? I just, I like Peter. So I, I know that you have problems with how much he quotes really offensive philosophers who, who have been canceled. He doesn't respect the fact that they have been canceled. He's like, slavery is a natural thing. You know, so that kind of stuff. Yeah, he's and, often misreporting and, the beliefs of other people. Yeah. In some weird way, like what he thinks is the case and instead of what they actually think. Like, what's up with that? Yeah, I'm okay with you guys running down Peter. I'm okay with that. Everything you said is true. I think he does present it in a way that's fine. I understand. But he doesn't. I mean, the problem, though, is that nobody know, nobody understands saunas like Peter does. That's the problem. We need his expertise. Yeah. He's the sauna man, and, and I just think he rocks. I'm totally paraphrasing here, but I think last time we did one of these sauna things, he was like, everybody, let's party, let's do this thing. And it just, like, it really, it lightened the mood. I don't know if I got that quote exactly, though. I, I could, you know, maybe you remember better than I do. My frustration is that there appears to be more back channels I was not included in that may or may not involve Peter's attendance. And if someone wants to come clean, hand on their head, I will absorb that. Do realize if Peter is not here, I did spring for groceries and we'll have to split them three ways rather than four ways. So have there been back channel discussions involving Peter? I mean, yes, that. Okay. <clears throat> hand on head okay thank you thank you and he said he said he probably would not bring anything additional that he would just mooch off whatever you had picked up that's a paraphrase that's not an exact quote he might not use the word mooch <clears throat> that's par for the course par for the course you have to remember i mean he's been bulimic for decades so he doesn't actually really need food what what i might matt hand on your head please he's been bulimic for decades this is new. This is new. With what? I mean, he blogs about it. Yeah, I mean, it, he has a blog that I'm not invited. Oh, yeah, yeah. Blogger.com. <laughs> Are you guys? Is this a joke? I, he, he's, I just assumed you didn't like him enough to read his blog. I didn't know you didn't know about we it. We invite him to. to. I mean, he talks about you all the time. On we it. invite him to long weekends. And y'all, you should have both hands on your head right now. This is, these are ridiculous revelations that I'm now just learning that you guys are here. Let's, let's pull up. Am I the odd one out? Cause I don't have any f- full, hey, hand on my head. I don't have any back channel conversations with any of, if any of some of you about, about the person left out. Zero. All right. So I'm, I'm just going to pull up yesterday's entry. There's some stuff about Avicenna. He's always about Avicenna. I don't care about Avicenna. Oh yeah. So, oh, my loser friend. And my good friends, and he doesn't say which is which, are having a thing. I'm going to join them. Maybe if I feel like it, love and kisses. Which of those friends, friend words were pluralized and which were singular? I mean, the first, the loser friend. Duh. Yeah, the loser was one of the group. Was singular. Yeah. But I mean, it could be, it could mean anything. I mean, he could be, he could have thought that Alan was joining us. And <laughs> I mean, <laughs> That's probably he was talking about, but you know, I would invite, I would invite Alan at this point. No, after, yeah, after I mean, everyone that, knows Alan's a loser. After yeah, that Alan's, shitty pull. A, Alan's a loser. Yes. Alan's a, Alan's a loser. Alan's a loser. He happens to be my deceased brother's best friend. And I, um, have probably been the one including him in things this whole entire time. And now we find that everyone feels he is a loser. Yeah. Probably talking about Alan. I mean, he has a blog. Too. Have you not seen Alan's blog? I've seen Alan's blog. Okay. Who's my I mean, he's pretty down on himself best friend. a lot. Yes. I mean, maybe, Alan, uh, maybe yeah. contributed any pieces to this puzzle to help us figure out for sure which of the of the three of us were, were are the cool people and which are the loser. 
I'm willing to accept loser status if this can be the end of the discussion and we can just move on to having fun this weekend. All right. I'll take it. I'll take the loser mantle. New some two losers. All right. We'll just we'll just see. I mean, if, if Peter shows up, he's going to be really sloshed. We could probably just, you know, direct him straight to the sauna. And as long as he doesn't puke in it, like, you know, it'll just brighten the day. And if he doesn't show up, then I don't know. You can keep talking shit about him, Bill. And I, I, I yeah. won't. And we got the bourbon to keep him quiet. We're done with the people that aren't here. We will only discuss what's happening in the moment. Nature hikes, board games, right? Sitting around the campfire. That's all we're going to do. That's all we're going to do. It's sauna ing. We're going to limit our conversations to the moment because that's what we do. That's what we do when we're having a, a guy's weekend. So on that note, are we uh, planning to chop any firewood or uh, do we, uh, do we bring any? I was told in the listing that there would be a supply in a small shelter behind the cabin. Oh, that's nice. Let's go check it out. I've not checked. All right. Oh, oh man. Yeah. You don't, you don't want to look in the shelter. I think it's uh, I think it's, I think Peter's been here. I think he beat us here. You don't want to see what's in there. Well, I mean, I kind of do from that description. Mark, do we need to call the police? I think, is that, should, is I that, think you should definitely an call an ambulance. I think you should definitely call well, the police. Right yeah, now. Right there. Is we'll right there. It's not Alan, is it? <laughs> We're done. We'll Scene. never Yay. know. Very nice. Very nice. We'll never know. It's off into the, to the improv stratus to never be known again into the, into the ether i never know exactly how especially the fact that we're doing this on video doesn't actually affect the way i do anything <laughs> in terms of <laughs> putting in my hand you know that i still don't understand that i'm being seen by people uh but hey i'm going into another room to check a thing no i don't really know how to do that <laughs> i just it's fine i just it's did fine. it that's all the audience will go with you. you make it clear what you're doing the audience will go they will excuse those things could imagine it's like one of those Spike Lee POV shots where it's just you're in the same place in the frame, but you move to the <laughs> the shed. Yeah, it's kind of like a Michel Gondry. The house just splits and you're in the shed. The set comes back together and we're all there. Oh, that would be a cool thing. Let's get on it, Mr. Monsieur Gondry. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so was it awesome? Him, right? was that was it a fun it, scene. I enjoyed it. Was it I enjoyed all it. obvious? So, Matt, you probably saw what I was trying to do with our thing, but I wasn't sure if I was actually... Do you want to just reveal the philosophical distinction that you had in mind that you brought in? Yes. So it seemed to me that you were looking for excuses to talk about people reporting that they know things or people reporting about what other people have said. Mm -hmm. That was my sense. So, you know, things like, I might be wrong, but I believe that Kirk Hammett said dot, dot, dot. Kirk Hammett said that he knows... Dot, dot, dot. Did I get that aspect of your improv right? Right. And mm -hmm. I wasn't sure, though, if that by itself was enough to convey the distinction. Could you even tell, Bill, what the distinction possibly? I'm sure you could. Yes. Know. Okay. So the big reveal <laughs> is that the topic that I mentioned to Mark is. Oh, let uh, him guess. Let him guess. Oh, oh, please. Yes. Something. But the first thing that came up to me is this whole notion of hearsay as opposed to direct evidence. And mm. how evidence may get filtered through other things. Oh, I thought they said this. I thought they said that. And as the further you get away from the source, you are now subjecting it to all these biases and opinions and thoughts and internal things. What is the truth? No, what is the truth? By the time the truth gets so far away from its occurrence, how much truth is left? Enough links in the game of telephone. Nobody can tell what happened anymore. Exactly. Yeah. And that might just reflect my not really understanding how the <laughs> distinction that you had put forward, Matt, is supposed to be used. So tell, explain it from the ground Let's hear, up. Let's hear the real answer, the true answer. I thought you set us up really nicely for it. The bit of jargon here is day ray versus day dicto attitudes and a bunch of goddamn Latin. You know how philosophers do, de jure, et cetera, et cetera. Pro tanto, they're always like lapsing into Latin for no apparent reason. But the idea is that when we use a word like want or believe, or desire in conjunction with an indefinite noun phrase like a or some or a plural noun phrase, we get this ambiguity. So uh, let's see if I can do it with one of Mark's Kirk Hammett examples. With the people being losers, those are good examples. So Bill said that a loser was invited to the party at the cabin. So that is ambiguous between two interpretations. The one interpretation is according to Bill, the person who was invited to the party is a loser. And the other interpretation is According to me talking about it, like that person is a loser. Bill doesn't think he's a loser, but that person straight up actually is a loser. So the one where you're talking about the person like in the world, not according to Bill, but just like in the world, that's called de re interpretation. And then the 
one where you're talking about like, what is it according to Bill? That's the de dicto interpretation. Okay, so it doesn't have anything actually to do with this is a direct quote, therefore it's de dicto, or this is merely a paraphrase, therefore it's de re. Although it seems like that is related somehow, but uh, it comes up in indirect quotation. That would be a connection. So if you're quoting directly, then you have to stick to that person's actual words and you don't really get the ambiguity because like whatever their words were or what their words were. But if you're paraphrasing an indirect quotation, you know, Mark said that he didn't want to come to this party with a loser. Then when you're indirect and you're paraphrasing, then the, this ambiguity pops up. Okay. So I, I was kind of close. I was kind of close. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In the ballpark. Yeah, definitely, in the ballpark. It's yeah, definitely yeah. related. Yeah. Okay. Are all direct quotes one style and all paraphrases the other? We just, are you just saying we just need to be clear with which one we're doing or, or is there more trouble we get ourselves into? Yeah, I think there is trouble we get ourselves into because I think people often will fall back on try to act like uh, I only meant the day Ray version, but really they were trying to get people to think about the day dicto version. And they kind of like, you can get into like clickbaity stuff by the slippage between those. Give us an example. Yeah, the kind of example that I have in mind here is like, if you think about a lot of our political discourse, you get stuff like, you know, we'll do a red one and a blue one. Uh, it'd be nice to everybody. <laughs> uh, so you might get things like, Obama wants to kill your grandmother with death panels. Now, that may be according to the person who believes that Obama wants to kill your grandmother with death panels. Maybe, in fact, Obama wants to do something that like amounts to killing your grandmother with death panels. Like, assume you're right about it. It's a bit of a thought experiment. But he didn't uh, say there's that. no way like... <laughs> He doesn't think of himself as uh, wanting to achieve that outcome. He thinks of himself as wanting to get everybody health insurance or whatever. <laughs> it's like when you describe the want, the other person's want from your point of view rather than from their point of view. That's the day Ray meaning. But then when it gets out there into the media, clearly the people who are saying this want you to think, oh, Obama actually literally does. He is. It's a direct quote. It's a direct quote. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Gotcha. Maybe a left wing version might be more like, Trump supporters are all trying to uh, are all a, racist. Uh, a white supremacist state. They want to evict all people of other races. But if you talk to Trump supporters, like you find that this desire is pretty much never actually expressed. But what's going on is uh, maybe they advocate certain policies, which in the opinion of the person saying that technically amount to creating a white ethno state. Sure, sure, sure. So I think people uh, in political discussions, they're a little bit slippery with these two interpretations and they're like when it's time to get people fired up that's when we want to turn on the interpretation oh yeah obama wants to kill your grandma and <laughs> and then when i'm getting asked about that claim later oh then i'm then i lean back on it no all i meant was he wants to do something which in my opinion opinion for these reasons i think will ultimately hurt your grandma gotcha makes total sense and we are thick of it <laughs> thick in it and and sick of it yeah <laughs> but i'm sure that's been going on to some degree for forever is simply telling people, hey, there's a distinction. That's probably not enough, is it? Probably not like the cure for it isn't just, and we all know cults exist. That doesn't stop them from existing. We all know patent medicine exists. That doesn't stop it from happening. You know, we all know <laughs> terrible things, you know, terrible people and terrible behaviors exist. I is there any way to combat it? Or is that just, you know, we're just going to stuck with it? That's a great question. Yeah. I have opinions about this. I don't know if do you want to weigh in, Mark, or uh, I can keep <laughs> giving my opinions about it, but. <laughs> I'm more just wondering if we understand the distinction enough, you know, outside of a strictly political context. So if I'm like, for this job, uh, for this job posting, we want to hire a sysadmin. That also has this ambiguous interpretation. It could be that the posting is for a sysadmin, and that's what specifically what we're looking for. So that would be the day, the day the dicto, dicto okay. interpretation. Yep. But the other thing it could mean is we've already picked the person we're going to hire. We've made them an offer. And we're hiring them to be, I don't know, whatever, president of the university. But they happen to be a sysadmin. So we're talking about the person rather than like what we want to hire. Okay, yes, that's... Ah, uh, okay, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I know this was relevant to... Have we talked, Bill, about intentions versus extensions? The concept, creatures with hearts and creatures with kidneys. Is that right, Matt? Is that <laughs> connection? That those both... Those mean mm -hmm. different things. They have different intentions. So the different de dicto interpretations. But as a matter of fact, every creature that has a heart has a kidney and vice versa. So you're picking out those terms actually have the same extension. So if you actually, what do you, what do you really mean by this term? Just point out the group, you know, there you go. 
And you'd be pointing out the same group in either sense. So in, in a sense, those things mean the same thing, even though they don't, obviously, the words themselves have different component meanings. A heart, heart does not equal kidney, but creature with heart picks out the same thing. So if you say, I don't want to uh, murder everyone with a kidney, but I do want to murder everyone with a heart, then uh, de re, those amount to the same thing. Right. They amount to the same thing. But if you didn't know that everybody who had a, which would be weird, but let's imagine if you didn't know that everybody who had a heart also had a kidney, then de dicto, you might want to kill everyone without a heart. But de dicto, maybe you wouldn't want to kill everyone with a kidney. You would only want to kill everyone with a kidney de re, because in fact, unbeknownst to you, everyone with a heart has a kidney. Uh, I would say I really don't know that fact. I think that philosophers have just told me that. And I, I, I've never confirmed (laughs) that. I could be remembering it wrong. And philosophers often work with the stock of like fake biological examples that are probably in fact not even true, but we just assume, you know, phlogiston is the go-to example and, you know, Hesperus and Phosphorus for some goddamn reason is the weirdest example of all time, but it's just been copied endlessly and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Gout makes you see yellow. Is that right? Something makes some particular oh, Lord, disease. I, yeah. Right. Is it gout anyway, or is it, um, I think leprosy <laughs> makes you see yellow. Jaundice, jaundice, maybe? jaundice, um, jaundice, there jaundice. You go. Pure yellow. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right. Yeah, but yeah, you yeah. probably don't see yellow. Anyway. Yeah. Let us stop for some sponsor messages. If you're listening to this podcast, you already know that life is full of big questions. What's our purpose? How should we live? What makes life truly meaningful? But what if I told you there's a guide for that, one that weaves through the centuries, picking up timeless wisdom from the greatest minds in history? Introducing The Good Life Method, a riveting new book by Paul Blatchko and Megan Sullivan, two philosophy professors at the University of Notre Dame. The Good Life Method dives deep into the greatest ideas from Aristotle, Plato, Marcus Aurelius, Iris Murdoch, W.E.B. Du Bois, and more, and applies their wisdom to real-world case studies. Whether you're grappling with love, finance, or the existence of God, this book encourages you to escape your own caves, ask stronger questions, and explore the nature of truth. So why wait? Start charting your own expedition to the good life today. Purchase The Good Life Method at your local bookstore or online, or visit goodlifemethodbook.com to learn more. Start seeking, start living. The Good Life Method. Well, I mean, again, to put on the not devil's advocate, but regular guy on the street advocate hat. <laughs> so, I mean, uh, you know, is it as simple as I need just to be more careful with a direct quote versus a, a paraphrase, you know, or is there something deeper in here that can really, that can really help my life? That can really change things for me and really. Maybe it's more or the, is it just maybe it's more just the, the awareness, being, being an awareness to it. Yeah. I mean, it's the quality of the paraphrase in the, the political example that Mac gave. It's not just a misquoting Obama to say, I want to kill elderly people. It's willful. He, it's he willful. Not. <laughs> it's a reinterpretation of the quote along vastly different assumptions uh, yes. that he does not actually share. Yeah. And it's the kind of thing. And because of the day Ray interpretation, it's sort of technically true. And one sense upon hearing it, maybe, I mean, I don't know. You have to believe that death panels will in fact kill your grandma for that. Let's we'll assume that for the sake of argument. It could be technically true, but even if it was technically true, it wouldn't be an accurate portrayal of what the actual project of Obama's is. Sure, sure, sure. But I think because it's technically true, people can kind of, that's an excuse to use to justify themselves saying it in this misleading way. Because, oh, there is a sense in which it's technically true, so I get to say it. We don't actually want the other person to think the more ridiculous thing. We already believe what we believe. We just want an excuse to believe it. (laughs) Or an excuse to convince someone else to, to believe it, even if it's flimsy or does not pass judicial evidentiary uh, <laughs> admission uh, principles. The groomers thing is a more, much more recent example of this is that you're in favor of grooming young children. Like, well, no, the thing I'm actually in favor I'm of. I'm a barber. Mark, I'm a barber. I am in favor of grooming. Young, I'm, a, I'm a pedi. I'm a, I'm a kid's. You know, difficult is to cut a kid's hair and they're screaming all the time. So yeah, I've got TV. Yeah, I got candy. That's a, that's a good point. It must be really hard for, for barbers right now. <laughs> I know. Well, go, well, I was thinking dog groomers. They actually use that term and going in and saying groomer and then leaving like that. They <laughs> yeah, just yeah. It makes them very sad. I mean, yeah, <laughs> I am. What's, you know. Yeah, that's a, that's a great example. Or like fascist, I think, is sort of a left wing example. You know, it'd be like, how could you vote for a fascist? Well, in my opinion, I wasn't voting for a fascist, but. There's this slippage where the person can convince themselves that even internally, the respect of the person they're talking about, they were voting for a fascist. But of course, that's not true. But because the thing is technically true on another interpretation, the day right one, they can sort of like, you know, trick themselves into think into attributing this very, actually very malicious reason to vote to their peer. Yes. And insist on that no matter, you know, what the other person says. 
Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's not a mere misunderstanding. In terms of the answer, I mean, no, who knows? You know, no political problem is solvable, but just, uh, you know, pushing the rock up the hill, uh, Sisyphus style. I certainly wouldn't mind it if we all tried to just like pay extra attention to what each other is saying before getting angry when talking about sensitive topics. And I think we're doing so little of that right now. Even doing any at all would be awesome. And I'd be ple pleased about it. The media is well placed to be the referee here and they don't always. No, I think they're really falling down on the job. Yeah. <laughs> They have their own problems going on, and and how do you make money in today's journalistic landscape is yes. pretty difficult. Is there any overlap, and you can say no, none at all, with the classic McCarthyist, when, when did you stop being dumb? You know, is there, is, there, <laughs> is, is there any overlap in that with the gotcha questions, or is that just kind of adjacent? Or uh... That's a great example, too. That's another classic philosophy of language. Uh, that's from the philosophy of language classroom. So that would be an example of verb stop, which triggers a presupposition. Sure. Okay. Namely, the presupposition that you used to. Uh, what was the example again? When did you stop being, when did you stop being a communist was the classic McCarthy one. It, which is you used to be a communist would be the presupposition there. And to even answer the question means validates the question. It's tricky, right? If you say yes, that presupposes that you used to be a communist. And if you say no, that also presupposes Presuppose, that you yeah. used to be a communist. So there's some trickery going on here where if you weren't a communist, there's no way you can actually answer the question. So I would certainly file this <laughs> and the de re de dicto sleaziness under both under the heading of like rhetorical games, the kind that like a, a nasty cross examiner might play to, to manipulate a jury or, you know, uh, that kind of thing. There's a book, I don't think it's out yet by these two philosophers of language uh, named uh, Jason Stanley and David Beaver. And their word for this, I kind of like, they call it a uh, hustle, linguistic hustle. <laughs> They try to give a little uh, outline, all different examples, different kinds of examples of like tricking people with the, the mechanics of language in this way. Totally. And trying to get squeeze every meaning we can squeeze, try to, you know, every interpretation, every possible way to read this thing. You know, how, how can we control even people misinterpreting? How can we control how they misinterpret it? How can we? That's annoying and gross, but very much with us and not going anywhere anytime soon. Yeah. Until now, because we've deconstructed on this podcast. The yeah. journey of a thousand miles. Mic drop. <laughs> Except not this mic because I really like it and it yeah, kind of yeah, yeah, replaces yeah. it. Metaphorical. That would yeah, be yeah. a de dicto mic drop. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I, I understand, uh, you gentlemen, uh, you know, wanted to report a crime. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thanks for coming by. We were over at came back from uh, the bar to our apartment, and the door was like had clearly been uh, been forced open, and we just we didn't even go in. So you still have them in. Right, right in there. Somebody could be in there right now. Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, you guys, it's just, it's just literally right around the corner. It's right around the corner. So we just like, hey, let's go to the, go to the cop shop. You know, let's 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 figure this out. You know. So it might have just been nothing, and you just didn't, you didn't go in and check. Well, somebody has to have been in there at some point or other, right? Because like the door is forced open. It's ripped open. It's splintered. Like the frame is splintered. You know. We don't even know how you could do that. Like, what do they have? Some kind of like weapon, crowbar or something, jackhammer. Yeah. I mean, you seem to know a lot about this. You seem to know about, uh, you know, how people open, open but Can things. you send an officer to our apartment, please? Can we please send an officer to our apartment? I mean, yeah, we'll, we'll get an officer out there. It's just, I'm just wondering. So, what do you think? I broke into my own apartment? Why would I do that? I have the key. Yeah. Why would you do that? That, that seems really peculiar that you would do that. We didn't do that. We didn't do that. We go up there. We come back. All right. It's one thirty in the morning going for my keys and we are sober. The door has been forced open. Clearly, door frame is splintered. We're like, holy crap, dude, let's run. It, it was faster to run down here to the police station around the corner than it was to call 911. All right. Th imagine this is a 911 call. Okay. All right. I'm, I'm imagining help. Okay. All right. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah, send was, an officer. My fancy kind of took me away there. Yeah. Yeah. Imagine so you imagine yourself doing, namely dispatching a car. Then instead of imagining that, do actually do that part. Do you know how expensive it is to, to get a car out? I mean, how, what's the value of the things in your apartment? You, you know, maximally could have been stolen there. Uh, I don't know. Does it matter? I mean, <laughs> we pay our taxes, you know, just we can walk there. All right, well, why don't you get it? Why don't you get an accounting and then we'll, we'll kind of compare, you know, with the cost of sending out the car and then we'll determine. We don't need a car. Just anybody. We can walk yeah, but we there. We can't go in there until we know it's safe to go in. That's the problem. Maybe the maybe the it's, it's a person still in there. Maybe they have oh, a gun. So I maybe see they... what's going on. So so go check if there's somebody in there 
and then you can come back and you can let me, you know, if there is somebody in there, we'll definitely send a car because that's something to be alarmed about. But if there's nobody in there, then, you know, you should just come back in the morning and uh, sort of fill, we'll have some reports for you to fill out and you'd report how much is lost. And then uh, we get busy with the murders and things and the more important crimes that we have to deal with. So you want us to knock on the door and ask, excuse me, are you a thief and are you currently in our apartment? Because the dispatcher wants to know before they send a car. Kindly tell us so that they can dispatch a police car. That's the plan. Huh? I mean, you generally don't want to warn a criminal that you're going to dispatch a police car because you want to keep them at the scene. You want to make them think that there's candy hidden. Like maybe so you could say, who doesn't like candy? I hope that nobody found my hidden stash of candy that's somewhere in the second bathroom. I don't know what where your most obscure room is. Uh, in fact, maybe yeah, you don't even have that room. And then they, you know, that really confuses them. Let's cut out the middleman and just send an officer over. We could, we could be there by now. This whole thing could be done. I mean, but just imagine that there's a way in which we could all work together. You know, we're co- about community policing. That means the community gets involved. They helps each other. I mean, you coming down here is a good first step. I think that if we could make a connection with the criminal, how about we just call your apartment and we see if, if they answer? I mean, the answer, we know they're there. Why would any criminal pick up the phone? <laughs> I mean, there could be a good offering like i i think the really the most suspicious thing is if you call and nobody picks up and then you know there's somebody there that does not want you to know that they're there and if they pick up how would how would it be different if there was no one there because they grabbed some stuff and left well then you have nothing to worry about well then the phone also wouldn't be answered yeah but i mean it seems like you got you got all the possibilities covered so all right it seems like if someone's there or not no one's picking up the phone you're kind of losing me here but I, th- I think what's really going on here is that uh, we got a failure to communicate. So I, I, I want you guys to empty your pockets right here. I, I got to make sure you don't have any uh, weapons. The first way to stop crime is to make sure that the criminals don't start doing the crime. So I think we can do some preventative work right here. Both of you down, down on the ground. Are you kidding? Are you kidding? Is this a joke? You're out. Hey, what are you doing? I stop. Mean, the, stop. Yeah. <laughs> Are you arresting I, me? I, I did, yeah. Am I under arrest? I didn't, I didn't Officer, like am I under tone. arrest? Eventually, maybe. You were going to just hold you for a while, and then we'll see. And then who, if there's somebody in your apartment, they'll definitely have left by the time we're done with this rigmarole. So uh, either way, it's going to work out well for you, uh, unless you're... Uh, did I understand you know, right that if if there was a murder happening in there, then you would set a car? It has to be like, oh yeah. you know, that oh, level definitely. Crime? So are you recommending we go in there and commit a murder to get the car out? Would that, would that uh, satisfy you? You extra down on the ground. You, you empty your, your, hey, take your on? shirt off. Take your shirt off. I want to see if you what? have a, a bomb strapped to your chest. Take, are you grooming us? Are you having us get undressed for your enjoyment? Is that what's happening? In some big, big, in your official capacity, are you convincing us to get undressed? It's a mischaracterization. I mean, it could be that the things that I have to do for my job do in fact give me a lot of sensual pleasure and they do uh you know make it worth coming in but you know otherwise it's it's not worth the salary so yeah we're, we're just gonna go in the back and uh and, and you can cool your jets for in a cell for a couple hours and then we'll see uh you know what's going on with your apartment you know how about we just leave we just leave I tell you, you, you let us go and we'll go and we'll just go to our apartment how about that all right you do that and then we'll uh you, you pass Matt, the go. test a real Matt, criminal would not ask in such a, a polite way so, oh my god there is someone in there don't go to the call 911 immediately. <laughs> all right, let's wrap that up. I, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Was, all right, that's very nice. Oh, Mark, I was going to give you a chance to be the uncooperative 911 operator. <laughs> Bill has run many a uh, frustration scene. Oh, yeah. Where uh, you did a fair job there, Mark. Uh, yeah, 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 actually, yeah. I guess it is usually me being the annoying one <laughs> anyway. <laughs> the, the, yeah, the frustration scene. I thought for is, some reason I was, I was switching roles. It was, it was quite realistic, I thought. Yeah, everything from, you know, who's on first. All the way to some of our favorite comedy sketches now lean on this frustration, uh, frustration yeah, yeah, yeah. game, which y'all did, did a fair job playing. Now, Mark, as far as my improv lesson goes, yeah, I will give you the line, both of you the line that demonstrated what I was doing. All right. And if you need me to emphasize a certain word, I will do it. We talked about the break in and everything that's going on. And then I said, can you send an officer? No, I don't. I mean, <laughs> other than prompting someone with a direct question questions are well rather as, as opposed to can the assembled police force send an officer and said it's can you send an officer 
any ideas what we're getting at here? Well, it reminds me of this uh, funny little uh, metaphorish thing we do where we say stuff like, I'm parked out back. But of course, like, I'm right here. I'm not parked out back. My car is ah. parked out back. So my car is, I, I'm using the word I for my car. Sure. So can you, you know, I mean, I guess really you're sort of asking the police department or, yeah. Well, I, I am asking Mark. So the reason we get is not why the police department, this unimpeachable, intangible thing mm-hmm. that is beyond that you and I, Matt and I can't appeal to. Can they send a police? No, no, no. Can you, Mark, send a police officer? And now whatever answer we get is now Mark's opinion or Mark's thought or Mark's way of thinking. And it takes the scene from what is going on to who is going on, if that makes sense. Oh, and it's a common little thing. It's a little baby thing, t- similar to you. It's funny how, how sometimes these improv lessons and the, the philosophy lessons get so similar. But the small little change of one or two words, and suddenly the scene is about Mark's recalcitrance, more so than the general police, uh, <laughs> if that makes sense. Policies. Policies. And even if Mark is leaning on policies, it is Mark leaning on policies. And we can say, why are you such a unknowingly misapplying all of them exactly so it becomes an orgy of incompetence or hiding behind policy hiding behind the like mark you're hiding behind these policies you are hiding behind these policies makes things personal and it makes things there is an answer to our conundrum and it isn't lobbying the city council to change police policy it's mark to do his job a specific person that we can then used to get ourselves frustrated by well the secret motivating factor <laughs> is my character did not want to get up from the desk to go investigate because you know exactly he had a boner because exactly. then the camera would have to follow you on youtube <laughs> that's yeah. true well uh, yeah often in life it's the kind of thing where you know customer service reps or anybody really they will i'm sure that's a philosophy thing appeal to the higher authority oh i can't do that there oh there's some other force beyond me i would love to change your your seat on the flight but i can't yeah. Because of something beyond me, you know, don't blame me. There's something going on beyond me. When in fact, 99 times out of a 10, well, well, the next question is, well, who can change it? Well, and it's like, no, this, this person is just being lazy or tired or, or, or maybe they really can't. But then again, they also have no interest in helping you to get that change. I think it's a really American phenomenon. Well, it depends on the country you're looking at. But um, like when I was in the Netherlands, I found interacting with bureaucrats that mid-level bureaucrats were given a lot of power. And we, you had kind of both consequences. You had that they were willing to help you, but you also had that they were given the power to help you and they weren't going to get blowback for it. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe a little more high stakes in the sense they give more responsibility, but it's also surely more satisfying to be able to actually help people than to like not ever do anything for fear of liability and so forth. Yeah, all of our favorite, you know, humorous characters, they have some kind of behavior. Something Marcus talked about, you did a very fine job in that scene, Mark, but I want it to be about you. I don't want it to be about an indictment of the Chicago Police Department. I want it to be an indictment about Mark's character. And to do that, we got to make sure we find the person in there. I feel like you picked up on that, Mark. Well, the same thing happened in the, in the cabin scene, where the what is, what are we doing at the cabin? What's the plan? Who's got groceries? You know, we can, we can have problems there. I don't want to split it four ways. I want to split it three ways. You know, but all those things aren't personal. The personal thing is, are you guys going behind my back? We can make things that this, the problem of the scene, the problem that's driving it is a people problem, a person problem. I see. If this person changed, the whole, the whole dynamic would change, you know, as opposed to, should we split the groceries three or four ways? It's like, well, there's no stakes for, for the observer has no stakes in that, <laughs> that situation. Oh, it's so much funnier to share it four ways and three ways. It doesn't matter. Uh, that's just a what? That's just a dumb what? It feels very Seinfeldy. You turn uh, what looks like it's going to be a narrative about, you know, couple of people trying to accomplish a goal and then what it the whole thing turns into instead is their complete failure to even start trying to accomplish the goal because they're stuck in the neuroses the whole episode totally and in fact they did a very good job of, of having very inconsequential what's marble yes, rye exactly yeah just yeah. a dumb little thing but it's in that dumb little thing that the people emerge and the decisions that get made are not rational not reasonable because of the people, not because the situation is necessarily remarkable. Does the Ray and Day Ray, is that, <laughs> that refers to the thing, right? Is that the, the, the thing? Yeah. Okay. So it's sort of the background assumption is that there is a truth of the matter. So right, the, I'm yes. now remembering the classic philosophy examples that we give are, I hate Spider-Man. No, no, no. You don't, you don't hate Spider-Man. You just hate Peter Parker. But 
didn't you know that he's actually Spider-Man? You know, you, in fact, there is a, a fact that these are the same person and, and whether yes. or not you know that, but in all these political examples we gave, you had to say, Matt, assuming that it is actually true <laughs> that being in favor of Obamacare will in fact kill old ladies mm-hmm. or whatever. And it just seems more of those situations, you know, if you're wondering like, when does this actually matter? And I was trying to even think, how would we put that in the scene that we just did? And there's another way you can frame it too. But if you don't like the, how things are in fact versus how, how they are according to the person whose attitude you're describing, you can also talk about it in terms of what is the case according to the speaker versus what is the case according to the person being talked about. So the day ray would be like, what's the case according to the person uttering the sentence? It's a, a different, slightly different possible way to, to make the distinction. So the death panel person would be like the day ray interpretation would be like, well, according to them, these policies do in fact end in killing your grandma. And then the day dicto interpretation would be according to Obama, these policies are there in order to kill your, <laughs> your grandma. Okay. So what's the status of hypothetical motivations that you're attaching to the mindset of a burglar who may or may not be there. So I'm talking about an X and then, say, you know, if there is an X there, then they for sure would answer the phone because they would be using reverse psychology and figured <laughs> if they didn't answer the phone, then you would think that they were there. So they would answer it. So you would think that they were not there. I don't know if there's any more to say about that besides that. <laughs> in terms of <laughs> language games. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a great question, right? Yeah. So what, what would a day interpretation of something that doesn't actually exist be? There, yeah, there's definitely a bunch of, you know, philosophy papers about that kind of thing. You know, Peter Geach was like really worried about like how you could uh, refer pronominally back to somebody who doesn't exist. So he had these examples about talking about a witch and then using the word she to, to refer back to the witch. But like she, what? Uh, but there, there is no witch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Fictional she. Yes. So the example of the Clark Kent and Superman or, you know, Spider-Man and Peter Parker, because neither of those actually exist. So you are making a day ray of the thing interpretation with a hypothetical thing. Makes it clear why you can make that transition from the truth versus what people say about it and the truth according to the speaker and the truth according to the quoted person. That was the difference. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And then probably if somebody's talking about Clark Kent and Superman and they know that Clark Kent is Superman, they're talking from the point of view of like a narrator of the story or someone reading the story. So that would be like the speaker's presupposition or the, you know, the speaker's belief that, that this is the case. Right. So all alleged statements of fact or background statements of fact that you're referring to implicitly refer to a speaker who is making that claim, right? Yeah. An omniscient, you know, whatever. Yeah. I think people, when thinking about how language works, usually assume that there is a person talking and a person they're talking at. But then there's lots of interesting mystery about like, well, what's going on with an answering machine message where maybe the person who left the message is dead or what's going on with a note written on a piece of paper and nobody knows who wrote it or what's going on with randomly generated words. Who's the speaker there? If it's uh, the, an exquisite corpse game that generated the, the words or a random number generated that generated the words. So if you want to understand the ambiguity as one as being a difference between whether the speaker endorses the view or whether the person being talked about endorses the view, then you probably need to come up with something to say about those other types of examples of language where it's not clear who the speaker quote unquote is. Yeah. All this is to sort of introduce, I don't know if we've really had too much philosophy of language on this show, Bill, but uh, I mean, we've talked about, I know it gets heavy categorization and stuff like that, you know, that's (laughs) more and more metaphysics, but you know, as it applies to words, uh, but we haven't done so much if you're if you're talking about logic or something, then you're not you're just talking about the forms of sentences. You're not talking about how they actually refer to things in the wild. Whereas if you're talking about metaphysics, then you're at least theoretically interested in saying something true about the world. So between yeah. those two is the philosophy of language, right? Logic is entirely abstract. Metaphysics is hopefully entirely concrete. But then like how do these things actually meet? How do we talk about them? That is exactly the philosophical computer science question I had for the bonus. Yeah, oh, nice, nice. <laughs> Let me also, I want to put in a plug for my cousin Vinny because uh, I think, I mean, uh, well, I love that movie. Or probably, your actual probably. cousin? <laughs> which which, yeah. to which are you hey. indicating? <laughs> <laughs> you didn't nice. know that well Vinny's actually the Unabomber, and so you just yeah, yeah. day Ray recommended <laughs> the Unabomber. Nice job, I just yeah, yeah, yeah. Unabomber. But I didn't, right, I didn't know about it, so. His blender is not plugged in. You want to put a plug in, you're trying to. 
he has some he's some appliance that is not currently in the socket. That is the main issue with Vinny. Okay. <laughs> Okay. So uh, what is the example from my cousin Vinny that you thought was irrelevant? Basically the whole movie is like jokes from a philosophy language class. So the two protagonists are being interrogated by the police and they're like, uh, you know, what point did you shoot the clerk? And then that's the first they ever hear about shooting the clerk. And then they say, what? I shot the clerk, but they mean it as a question. They're like, wait, wait, what? You know, but then it gets transcribed as a sentence. <laughs> and then he said, I shot the clerk. I shot the clerk when they're reading it back later. There's also like this whole bit in the movie where Joe Pesci is like being woken up every morning by a train in the hotel. And, you know, he gets woken up at like six in the morning and he runs down to the front desk and he's like, does a train come by here every day at six in the morning? And the guy's like, nope, that's very unusual. And he's like, great. And then the next day he gets woken up again by the train. He runs down and he yells. He's like, I thought you told me the train only rarely comes by at six in the morning. And the guy's like, it usually comes by at five. Um, <laughs> well, most, and then of course the example, the type of example you gave, what did you stop being a communist that comes up at the end with Marissa Tomei's thing? Uh, you know, how long does it take for the starter on a blah, 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 64 Chevy, blah, 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 uh, to start? Uh, and she's like, I can't answer that question because there is no such thing as a Chevy 64, blah, blah, blah. So all the humor in the movie is based on, um, people misinterpreting what the implied meaning is from what they literally, what other people literally said. So anyway, I, this is just to say in general, I think philosophy language is a uh, philosophy language and comedy is like ripe is like ripe terrain. Oh yeah, and I'm sure the old UC uh, University of Chicago people back in the 50s and 60s were leaning on that kind of stuff, <laughs> left, right, and center in the old days. Yeah, that'd be yeah. interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Second City is actually started by a modal logician. Turns out, indeed. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. Thanks, uh, Matt. Hey, so based on these two, we didn't we didn't warn you, but you probably knew. <laughs> that you have to now decide whether Bill's uh, improv lesson about making everything personal and or the thing that you brought in, mm-hmm, I mm-hmm. guess we can always vote, you know, the three of them. But but you're the prime decision maker. Which one do you think is going to have the more powerful effect on on you in the world from this discussion? You're the judge. You uh, ju- yes. just philosophy versus improv. I mean, I feel like I have a conflict of interest here, but. Uh, we always do so bill's point about making the bit all about a person's neuroses uh i'm gonna i'm gonna i'm gonna give the i'm gonna give the nod to that because uh i'm a massive seinfeld fan and that uh really brings true a a type of comedy that i really enjoy that i hadn't really thought about before where the whole narrative gets like derailed by somebody unnecessarily (laughs) not being able to get over something or get through something that might be able to like emotionally uh come to grips with something I'm really drawn to that kind of narrative, any kind of like movie or TV show or book where the entire thing ends up being what was supposed to be like a quick digression. I love that kind of structure. Sure. I will graciously accept the victory. Is that like Kierkegaard's, what is the name of that postscript to a uh, unscientific? Oh, including unscientific postscript, which I haven't actually read, but I do remember the title of. Yeah, nobody's, <laughs> I, I don't know anybody. So it is, I guess he wrote a, sh- a fairly short essay and then this concluding unscientific postscript to the essay is much, <laughs> much, much longer. It's like one of his fattest books that he ever wrote. <laughs> yeah, so. yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> well, even just the fact that that happened tells us a lot about miscommunication, that there's always two, three, <laughs> four ways to take anything. So, of course, the explanation of the statement is longer than the statement. And with Kierkegaard, there's always like 50 levels of parody happening. He's like the ultimate Peppy the Frog, like meme internet person before his time. You know, N squared levels of self-referential, you know, performance art. And Day Ray, he wanted to kill all the Jews. Sorry. <laughs> Just throw it a bit of slander. Wow. I, I don't know. I don't wow. Know. He never said that. It wasn't Day Dicto, but you know. There were some things in there. Based, based on what he wanted to do. It's pretty clear. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's not clear. Un- That's what he was really after. All right. Yeah, with, not with, a- with that bit of slander, let's... <laughs> Seriously, Mark. Gee, that's how you want to end? That's where you want to leave the folks with? We'll we'll have some after talk. People can uh, subscribe. (laughs) Patreon.com slash philosophy improv. In which Mark will make a sincere apology. (laughs) (laughs) Sorry, Kierkegaard. I'll do it now. Uh, Sincere apology to all Danes. Yeah. (laughs) Thanks, Matt. I sure learned a lot from both of you today. I learned a lot from both of y'all. Same here. And scene. If you enjoyed this, get more at philosophyimprov.com. If you're hearing this on the Partially Examined Life feed, please go subscribe directly to the Philosophy vs. Improv podcast so you won't miss any episodes.
and you'll see our whole back catalog of episodes in that feed. While you are on the Apple Podcasts site subscribing, please leave a nice rating and review of this podcast. Better yet, avoid all the ads. Here are post-game discussions for nearly every episode and experience the video for this and most other recent episodes at patreon.com slash philosophy improv. Thanks so much for listening. I should sell my soul. I should sell my soul. I should sell my soul.